It's good to be back in uh, Baku, and it's good to be here, not least because that reflects uh, how much we value the partnership between uh, Georgia and uh, NATO. And uh, I also welcome the fact that uh, you just a few weeks ago visited uh, Brussels. Now I am here. And it this is my video update on this Wednesday midday, March the 20th. Let's talk about some news. And in my video update from yesterday, I briefly mentioned a statement from a retired Polish general who said that Ukraine has, uh, has suffered millions of casualties. And uh, let me read you exactly what that Polish, a retired Polish general said from yesterday. They are missing over 10 million people, referring to Ukraine. They are missing over 10 million people. I estimate that the losses should be counted in the millions, not hundreds of thousands. There are no resources in this country. There is no one to fight. The Ukrainians are losing this war. Retired General Andresak stated, pointing to media reports suggesting that Kiev is running out of anti-aircraft missiles to protect itself from Russian strikes. So Shoigu said about a month ago that according to the Russian Ministry of Defense, Ukraine has suffered 444,000 casualties. But uh, here you have a retired Polish general saying that the number of casualties is in the millions. He doesn't give a number, but he says it's in the millions. Well, uh, Elensky last month said 31,000. 31,000 KIA is what Elensky said. And the New York Times six months ago, six months ago said 70,000 Ukraine uh, casualties. So the, the, the numbers are obviously all over the place, but if I had to, if I had to uh, rely on on a number for for casualties, which which number is the most accurate? I would still go with the Russian uh, Ministry of of Defense, and I would say that that number is on the conservative low end of things. But um, this comment from the retired. Polish general had a lot of people talking. And, uh, and yesterday afternoon, the French media was wargaming a, a French incursion into Ukraine. And uh, they had a, a military analyst or former military official. I'm not sure who this guy was. And they had these huge, huge screen and in back of him with a map of, uh, of Ukraine. And this guy was talking about uh, the, the strategy that the French military would employ if, if it were to send uh, troops into Ukraine. And the number that he put out there was, was actually specific, quite specific. He said 20,000 French troops would go into Ukraine. And, uh, and he said there were two possible scenarios. And it could be a combination of both. He said, one scenario is that the troops, the 20,000 French troops, go to the area of the uh, Dnieper and, um, and they stabilize the, the lines there and it could free up Ukraine uh, forces to, to go further towards, towards the front line. And they could also act as a tripwire, he said, because these French troops, they would basically tell Russia or they would signal to Russia you can't move any further west. Here's the, here's the French military. You shall not pass, <laughs> right? You shall not pass. That's basically what uh, this French analyst, a former French military official, was saying during this TV segment. He also said that the other option that the French military could do, and it could be in combination with, with the troops acting as, as, as a tripwire, a signal to the Russian uh, advancing forces that they can't move further west. Another thing the French troops could do is they could uh, they could be deployed to the border with Belarus and they would uh, deter any type of incursion from from Belarus from uh, from north to to south towards Kiev. 
So that's what uh, what this guy said the strategy could be with sending 20,000 French troops into Ukraine. But uh, if, if France was to send 20,000 French troops into Ukraine, well, it's not just about sending 20,000 people into Ukraine. There's a whole bunch of other logistics and other things that has to, that has to follow the, uh, the deployment of 20,000 troops into Ukraine. And, and we, would, we would know about it. Everyone would know about it. But um, that's, that's what uh, these guys were wargaming on this French uh, TV channel. And then, then you had the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service chief, Sergei Narushkin, say that France is indeed ready to deploy 2,000 French troops into Ukraine. In the statement on Tuesday, the SVR chief said the French armed forces had become concerned about the rising number of French nationals dying in Ukraine. The casualty level has supposedly surpassed a psychological threshold and could trigger protests. The statement said, adding that Macron's government was concealing this information about delaying the moment it would have to be revealed. According to the spy chief, the French military is worried about the government's plan to send the contingent to Ukraine, considering that such an operation would be difficult to conduct without Russia noticing. The French soldiers would indeed become a legitimate priority target for attacks by the Russian armed forces, Narushkin said. So if he's saying that 2,000 forces would be impossible to hide from the Russian military, can you imagine 20,000 French forces? We would all know about it, 20,000. Uh, French uh, troop deployment into Ukraine, but he's saying that uh, basically he's saying that that France is uh, has suffered uh, alarming losses in Ukraine, like French mercenaries uh, have have been killed in large numbers in Ukraine. Macron is hiding this this fact from the French people, and if I'm reading this correctly from Narushkin, he's basically saying that France is now going to deploy 2,000 additional French troops into Ukraine in order to kind of muddy the waters and to try and cover up the, the losses that the French military or French, or French mercenaries that they have incurred to date. And so he's going to, Macron is going to send these 2,000 French troops into Ukraine to kind of muddy, muddy things up a bit because if the French really knew how extensive the involvement in, uh, in Ukraine was, there would, be, there would be protests in the streets. And that's something that Macron is trying to avoid. And then you had a French army general uh, give an interview with Le Monde, Pierre Schill, and he said that French forces are ready to, uh, to fight a conflict, to fight a war. He didn't get into the details, at least from what I read. He didn't exactly say who the French army is ready to fight with, but we all understand that he's talking about Russia. French forces are ready, Schill told Le Monde, stressing that whatever the developments in the international situation, the French can be convinced their soldiers will respond. Schill said France has international responsibilities and is linked by defense agreements to states exposed to major threats and must, must therefore have its forces trained and interoperable with allied armies. Interoperable with NATO. And when he talks about uh, defense agreements that France has, he's talking about France and NATO, but he's also talking about the security agreements that France entered into with Ukraine a couple of weeks ago. And when he's talking about threats that France faces, he's obviously talking about Russia uh, coming from uh, a, a French general, what, what else would you expect a French general to say? That France is at least on record, because we know off record from that um, article that came out from the publication Marianne a couple of days ago, we know that off record, the French military is telling Macron that uh, the military is just a bunch of cheerleaders compared to the power of the Russian military. But on the record, in an interview with Le Monde, uh, a French uh, army general, of course, is going to say that France is ready and that France is, the French army is prepared to take on any threats 
that come their way, including, including a threat from Russia. That's what the French uh, general was, was basically saying in this interview. So you know, if, uh, if France did deploy 2,000 troops into, uh, into Ukraine, um, I, I don't think the Russians would, I mean, Arushkin said, said they would be a legitimate target, but if those troops were deployed in the west of Ukraine or, or wherever, then I don't think the Russians would go out of their way to target those troops, unless those troops were sitting in a, in a military uh, warehouse or storage facility that the Russians got wind of, then the Russians would take out that storage facility. But for the most part, I think 2,000 French troops, the Russians would just continue to, to, to go about their strategy, which is uh, aggressive attrition and, uh, and annihilating the, the Ukraine military. I don't think 2,000 troops would throw the Russians off course or would, would um, lure the Russians into, into changing their, their tactics just so they could go after these, these 2,000 French forces. I think the Russians would just be like, whatever, you send 2,000 troops into Ukraine. If, uh, if they get in our way, then they're going to be annihilated. But if they don't get, a, get in our way, we're just going to continue to do what we're doing. And, and uh, if, if we get to a point where we have to face off with these 2,000 French troops, we're just going to annihilate them and just keep on, on progressing with our uh, overall strategy. Now, 20,000 troops, I think that would be a different, a different story because 20,000 troops would inevitably get, get involved in the actual direct conflict with, uh, with the Russian military. But look, you know, you send 2,000 troops, the 2,000 become 4,000, the 4,000 become 12,000, and, and that's how, uh, how the escalation uh, begins. But, um, you know, France, they came out with a statement yesterday evening, and they, uh, they denied Narushkin's claim about the 2,000 troops. They said that, uh, that this statement from the Russian intel, the foreign intel chief, is false. And that France, at the moment, France is not sending 2,000 troops into Ukraine. They haven't sent, and they do not plan on sending 2,000 uh, French troops into Ukraine. Whether you believe that or not, who knows? Uh, we know that France has mercenaries in Ukraine, but we're always talking about, like, French military. Um, not not mercenaries or not French soldiers fighting with, uh, with the Ukraine patches or the Ukraine flag. We're talking about French soldiers fighting under the French flag when we're talking about 2,000 troops or 20,000 troops. Anyway, that's everything that went down yesterday. Not everything, but most everything that uh, went down yesterday. And um, what's going on here? Is this part of Macron's strategic strategic ambiguity plan <laughs> macron's master 5d chess move strategy of strategic ambiguity is that what's going on here is this strategic stupidity um maybe <laughs> maybe that's what's going on here i think i think three things are happening uh, and probably three things all at once are going on here all at the same time on on the one on the one hand, I think this is a lot of typical Macron. Flip-flopping, bluffing, talking tough one day and then backing down the next. And uh, this, is, this is typical little Napoleon, Jupiter uh, behavior coming from Macron. And I think we're seeing a lot of, a lot of uh, fear-mongering and distraction from Macron, distracting from the French uh, farmer protests from the state of, of, of the French economy uh, to various um, wife issues, rumors that are dogging Macron. I think a lot of this is distraction. I also think this is, this is Macron's way of, of covering his, his butt because he knows that, uh, that Ukraine has lost his conflict. He knows that Russia is going to win. And this could be Macron's way of, uh, of, of, of telling NATO and telling the collective West and even telling the French citizens when, when Project Ukraine does collapse, uh, telling the French people, look, um, don't blame me. NATO, 
uh, United States, people of France, I'm not at fault. I, uh, I wanted to, to take on Russia. I wanted to send troops into Ukraine. I wanted to, to keep Ukraine fighting and to keep Ukraine afloat. So this is not, this is not my fault. It was, it was Germany that, uh, that let Ukraine sink. So that could be what's at play from Macron. I'm sure that a lot of this type of, of thinking is, is going through Macron's uh, little Napoleon head. But uh, another thing we could be seeing is, is just panic in, in the collective West in general, especially in the European Union. Uh, there, there is no plan. They're kind of all over the place. You know, Macron is talking about, one day he's talking about troops in Ukraine. The next day he's saying, we're not sending troops into Ukraine. Uh, Maloney came out yesterday and she said that, uh, that in no way should, uh, should NATO forces be sent into Ukraine because that's going to lead to World War III. We had the Italian uh, defense minister come out a couple of days ago and pretty much say the same thing. No uh, NATO troops in Ukraine because that's going to take us to, to World War III. Uh, Schultz is saying no Taurus missiles to Ukraine. Annalena is working behind the scenes and, and trying to sweet talk Schultz into sending Taurus missiles into Ukraine. Being, meanwhile, you have uh, Czech, uh, Czech Republic President Pavel running around the world trying to, uh, to find 800,000 uh, artillery shells to, to send to, to Ukraine. Uh, Greece and Mitsotakis, they're sending weapons to Ukraine. Pistorius yesterday said that Germany's going to send 500 million in weapons to Ukraine. And, uh, and then you have Politico coming out with an article saying Europe's soldiers keep quitting just when NATO needs them. And Politico is reporting that, that uh, soldiers who are currently serving in, uh, in the militaries throughout Europe they're leaving the militaries because uh, they don't want to go to war with Russia. They don't want to go to war in Ukraine because uh, the, the benefits of the pay sucks and, and just all of these things. And so I, th I think in general, there is no plan. I think what you're seeing right now is just kind of everyone saying, saying anything and everything that's, that's, on their, that's on their mind, all the fear, all the panic. They're afraid of, of Trump winning the elections. They're afraid that the United States is going to, to abandon Europe and is going to leave them. Um, so, so they're just coming out and they're just saying all kinds of, of things that's, uh, that's going through their, 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 their heads, that's, that's on their minds. You know, you, Kaya Kallis is, is talking about how we shouldn't be afraid for a nuclear war and Putin's bluffing. And then you have other EU leaders who are, who are saying that, that Putin is going to invade Europe. Uh, all the EU leaders are saying that Putin is going to invade Europe any day now. And, and they're all over the place. So there is no plan. There is no plan. The, they had one plan in place and only one plan in place. And that plan was uh, a regime change in Russia, a collapse in the Russian economy because of the sanctions, a regime change in Russia, and then the balkanization of the Russian Federation. That was their plan, and that was their only plan. And uh, they bought into that plan. They believed in that plan. They thought that plan was rock solid and was not going to fail. Ursula went to, uh, went to the United States in November, October, November of 2021. She sat down with the Biden White House. They laid out their entire sanctions plan. They put it all out there on the table. They strategized it. They, they got the clown puppet in Kiev to run around the Munich Security Conference and talk about how uh, Ukraine is going to enter NATO and how Ukraine is going to get nuclear weapons. And uh, they finally got uh, Ukraine to provoke Russia into, into the conflict. And then they threw the sanctions at Russia and they were 100%, 1,000% convinced that the Russian economy was going to collapse the Russian people would get out onto the street. They would overthrow Putin and Yolanda Navalny would, would ride into Red Square on horseback and become the leader of the Russian Federation. And they were so certain, they were so confident in their plans that Russia would collapse with the sanctions and uh, Putin would be, would be regime changed out that they were even holding conferences. I reported on this two years ago. They were even holding events, like two, three-day events, 
in Brussels at the headquarters of the European Union where they were talking about all of the countries that were going to be created from the Russian Federation. They even had names for all the countries. They had names. They had languages. They had the leaders of these countries. They had keynote speakers at these events like Kasparov and all of these guys. Um, they, they were convinced that this is how everything was going to play out. And you were going to get six, seven different countries out of the, uh, the balkanization of the Russian Federation. And uh, they were going to have access to all of the cheap resources. And that's how they saw this, this entire thing uh, unfolding. And now that it has gone completely wrong, <laughs> completely wrong, uh, they, they're in a panic. They don't know what to do. So they're all over the place now. And, and the reality has hit um, with, the, with the failure, with the defeat of the super duper 2023 spring counteroffensive with the capture of Avdevka, the reality is finally starting to, to hit them that they're, they're losing. They're going to lose. And so they're, they're all over the place. And, and you have elections in the United States and they're afraid of, of Trump winning. So Macron could be bluffing. He could be flip-flopping. He could be distracting. All these statements could be part of, of just an overall EU panic. Or, or perhaps, perhaps uh, Europe is planning for a war. NATO is planning for a war, but not now. In like one or two or three, three years' time. NATO is not prepared to go to war with Russia right now. And even the United States is telling Europe, not now. We have an election. If, uh, if we go to war with Russia right now, then there is zero chance that, Bi that Biden's going to win, like absolutely zero. And so the United States is telling Europe right now for the next seven, eight months, uh, don't, don't bother us with, uh, with conflict, with troops in Ukraine, with U.S. troops, boots on the ground in Ukraine, because we're in an election cycle. So that's what the U.S. is telling Europe. But in a year or two, Possibly. And if Biden wins the, the presidency, definitely. If Biden wins, no doubt about it, in my opinion, the United States and NATO, they're going to war with, uh, with Russia if Biden wins the election. But look, NATO's building this big military base in Romania. It's going to be the biggest base in all of, in all of NATO's history. And, uh, and Moldova, they're talking now about Moldova entering the EU and entering NATO. So Moldova enters NATO. They build a big military base in Romania. And, uh, and they're ready in, in a year or two to take on Russia in, uh, in the Black Sea, say, area. They understand that eventually Russia is going to, to control the entirety of of the Black Sea, the entire coast of the Black Sea. They understand that. And so they're building this military base and they're preparing to, to challenge Russia in a year or two or three. They're going to get Moldova into NATO. They're going to build the base and they're going to say, okay, Russia, you're over there. We're over here. Let's, uh, let's fight. So that could be what they're preparing. And of course, all the talk about about war with Russia. Right now, all the talk about an eventual conflict with Russia is, is preparing the European people for an eventual smash. Talk about it now and prepare them. Slowly, slowly prepare them so that in one or two years, especially if Biden wins the White House, then in one or two years, when uh, the smash does happen, the citizens of Europe aren't, aren't saying, how did this happen? <laughs> you know, the, the leaders of Europe can say, we were telling you that this was going to happen a year or two ago. Weren't we warning you? Weren't we telling you that we're going to go to war with Russia? We're going to go to war with Russia? Well, Biden is, is uh, president of the United States, and we now have the green light to, to go to war with Russia. So I think it's like a combination of all of these things. Of course, everything can change in a month or two or three or, uh, or nine. Everything can change, but right now I think that's what's going on. I think it's a little bit of all of these things that's, that I just mentioned. But um, yeah, so, so Austin, Austin was in Germany, the Secretary of Defense. So this was his first trip since his, 
is uh, mysterious surgery. And, uh, and Austin, you know, Austin kind of told the, uh, the NATO defense ministers, especially the European defense ministers, kind of what Lindsey Graham, in my opinion, told Alensky yesterday, which is, you know, we, yeah, we support Ukraine as long as it takes. We got to get more weapons to Ukraine. Ukraine needs to mobilize. They need to continue to fight Russia. We can't let Ukraine fall. But, it, you know, when you listen to Austin, it was kind of like the, the same tone as, as Lindsey Graham and what he told uh, Alensky, which is, you know, you guys, the, the U.S. is going to, to be out of the action for a couple of months until the elections, but you guys keep on fighting. <laughs> That's pretty much what, what I got out of Austin's statements. Uh, the head of the Pentagon was in Germany for a meeting of the so-called Ukraine Defense Contact Group at Ramstein Air Base in his first overseas trip since his hospitalization in January. Quote, today Ukraine's survival is in danger and America's security is at risk, Austin, Austin said at a press conference after the meeting. Keeping the weapons and equipment and ammunition flowing is a matter of survival and sovereignty for Ukraine and a matter of honor and security for America. Nothing new. He's, he didn't really say anything new. Ukraine, keep on fighting. Let's keep the weapons flowing, Europe. Keep the money flowing, Europe. We'll do whatever we can. We'll try to get the $61 billion. But if we can't get the $61 billion, just keep this thing going. For now, there will be no U.S. boots on the ground. But uh, after the election, who knows? But I, I think Austin's message was was along the same lines as Lindsey Graham's message to Alensky yesterday. And that's what Austin was basically telling the defense ministers in Europe as well. Really, he said nothing new. This is, this is a matter of honor for America. <laughs> you know, whatever, bro. <laughs> whatever, Austin. It's a matter of honor for America. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Europe, Europe is going to have to find a way to keep Ukraine afloat until November 2024. The U.S. will try, the Biden White House will try to get money. They'll get 300 million there, 500 million there. They'll find a billion underneath some sofa cushions. Maybe they'll approve 61 billion. Maybe they'll approve 30 billion, who knows? But, um, you know, there, there's an election in the United States right now. And, and I think that's the message that they're sending to to their EU vassals. So, you know, Europe is, <laughs> Europe is, is, is effed, man. They are, they are so effed. They really, they really dug themselves a massive, huge hole. And they don't only have to find a way to keep Project Ukraine afloat and to keep this war going. Um, they have to find a, a way to keep the, the war going, Project Ukraine going, because in Europe, their economies are sinking. And they need to keep people afraid. They need to keep European citizens afraid. And they need to keep them distracted because the situation in Europe is beyond bad. The Guardian put on an article, German living standards plummeted after Russia invaded Ukraine, says Economist, energy price shocks had huge knock-on effect with real wages falling further in 2022 than in any year since 1950, says a report. <laughs> the living standards plummeted because Russia invaded Ukraine. You see the narrative that they want to get out there? They have to keep the war going. Europe has to keep this war going. Because if everything collapses, then eventually European uh, citizens, German citizens are gonna look at their government. They're gonna say, you promised us X, Y, and Z, and look at where we are. And don't give me, don't give me this, this BS about, I hope the sun wasn't, I didn't, I didn't see the sun was hitting the, the camera this way. And uh, German citizens are going to say, don't give me this, this BS about it's Russia's fault or this is all because Russia invaded Ukraine. And that's the last thing that, uh, that Olaf Scholz and Baerbach and all the German 
and uh, European political uh, class want to see happen. So they want to keep the fear and this war going. They have to keep the fear and this war going. It wasn't the sanctions. It wasn't the fact that someone, Gilligan, the skipper, Zaluzhny, blew up the Nord Stream uh, pipeline. No, no, no. It was Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It wasn't the actions that Ola Schultz and Baerbach and Habeck uh, took against Russia that has led to the German uh, economy deindustrialization. And by the way, what, whatever happened to the narrative that it was Zeluzhny who was coordinating the Nord Stream pipeline sabotage? The BBC told us it was Zeluzhny. The Washington Post told us it was Zeluzhny. Uh, the New York Times told us it was Zeluzhny. <laughs> whatever happened to that storyline? Nothing. <laughs> He's ambassador of the UK now. <laughs> All right, let's see here. Peter Navarro is going to prison. The architect of President Trump's trade war with China has become the first former White House aide to be imprisoned for refusing to cooperate with U.S. lawmakers. A 74-year-old economist who served as a senior trade advisor to Trump reported to federal prison on Tuesday at a minimum security facility in Florida. Navarro was sentenced in January to four months in prison after being convicted of contempt of Congress for refusing to testify to the U.S. House Committee that investigated the January 2021 Capitol riot. And the Biden White House lectures us about Russia, Putin, and Putin going after political opponents and Navalny and all of that stuff. And, and here you have an economist, Navarro, about to serve a four-month prison sentence. All right, let's do a clown world and we will wrap this video up. How about the fact that the story that Ukraine is going to honor Mr. Hunka. You remember Mr. Hunka, Yaroslav Hunka, the person that Trudeau and Alensky and Alensky's wife and the entirety of the Canadian uh, parliament uh, clapped for and gave a standing ovation to? Well, Mr. Hunka, he is going to be honored by Ukraine, by the Ternopol region in western Ukraine. They announced this on Tuesday. He is going to be presented with a medal on his 99th birthday. The medal is going to be presented to his great niece. Hunka served in the 14th Waffen SS Division, which was made up of Ukrainian volunteers and was responsible for atrocities against Poles, Jews, and Soviet resistance. Ternopol official Oleg Sirotyuk handed the Yaroslav Stetsko Medal for Service to Hunka's relative, Olga Vitkovska, with the expectation that she will eventually present it to her great uncle in Canada. No NAZIs in Ukraine. No NAZIs in Ukraine. Let's just give a medal to Hunka. <laughs> Let's give a medal to this guy. But there are no NAZIs in Ukraine. All right, that is the video, everybody. TheDuran.Locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, and Rockfin. And go to the Duran shop. 20% off all merchandise with a Greek flag. That is the special that we are running at the Duran shop. One sec. There you go. There's my t-shirt with the Greek flag. All right, everybody. Take care.